Hi there, I am John Evans, and welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. In today's episode, we will be dealing with the resurrection, and of course the resurrection of the dead, which comes at the end of all of our creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, both as a historical event, past and future. But before we go into these details, we must first address, of course, the nature of our investigation. Any investigation, whether it be into matters biblical or matters scientific, must rest upon the principle of truth. Before the throne of Pontius Pilate, the prisoner, Christ, was asked this mocking question by Pilate. Quid est veritas? What is truth? Pilate was meaning to toy with the prisoner Christ. What he did not realize was that the truth, the second person of the Trinity, the creator of the world, was standing right in front of him. But of course, we are still left with that principal question. What is truth? Can truth be objectively explored? Well, fortunately for us, the, ter- the 13th century saw St. Thomas Aquinas in Bonaventure wrestling with this question. Aquinas, a Dominican, was dealing with the question of faith and reason. If the ultimate end of truth can be explored, we can do so empirically through some modes of evidence. The first mode, of course, is called philosophy. The term philosophy means the friend or lover of wisdom. We can observe material functions in the world and by observation develop evidences. This is the line of inquiry which allows us to understand natural law and positive law. At the same time, there is also faith, which leads us to revelation. There are some truths which reason alone cannot grasp and that have been revealed to us by means of direct contact with the divine. And of course, the perfect example of both faith and reason being joined together in terms of an investigation is for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Inevitably, we must turn, of course, to what the authors of the New Testament meant by resurrection. Now, for many of us, we often view death simply as our soul in a very neoplatonic sense, soaring up into the heavens little by little until we come into the presence of God and reach paradise or heaven. However, in a first century Jewish context, the time in which Jesus was teaching and preaching and spreading the gospel, the good news, this was not the case. In fact, it was believed that at the end of the world, there would come a time in which all people, both the righteous and the wicked, would be raised from the dead, and that they would be clothed with something called the resurrection body, and that they would be judged by God. Yet this resurrection was to take place sometime in the distant future, not in the present age. Therefore, when Christ rises from the dead in the New Testament, This is a disturbing moment for many first century Jews who are onlookers. The early disciples of Christ would have been alarmed and surprised. Something seemingly beyond God's plan had occurred. And yet, of course, we know by reading the Messianic prophecies of Daniel, of Isaiah, of Ezekiel, and of Daniel, that we have clear evidence that the prophets of the Old Testament predicted the death and resurrection of Christ as the atonement by which the sin of Adam could be reversed. Now, of course, this means that people didn't go around expecting resurrections every time, refuting often the arguments of the skeptics that this was simply expected. This was not. We almost must have to look at the perspective also too from the pagans who were onlookers at Christ's resurrection. Women such as Claudia, the wife of uh, 
Pontius Pilate, the procurator. We know that Claudia calls Jesus um, in her dream in the Synoptic Gospels, the just man. This reference to a just man may, may be a reference to Plato. In Plato's Republic, there's a prophecy of a just man who will come and be an enlightened philosopher king. He will lead all people into righteousness. Plato believed in that philosophy which we have alluded to, of the soul just wafting up into heaven and seeing heaven as the ultimate goal rather than heaven touching down to earth. And yet, interestingly enough, even Claudia recognized here was an event, the resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection, which was fundamentally different, fundamentally new. As to Pilate's fate and Claudia's fate, um, we have no evidence as to what happened to them after the resurrection event, not in the Western church. But there is some traditions, both I believe in the Ethiopian church and Coptic church, that they later on became believers. Other people believe that they were killed, I believe, under Emperor Nero, Nero or Diocletian. I believe it was Nero. So obviously, an event as great as the resurrection should have some strong empirical evidence. It should not rest purely upon revelation alone. And we do have, interestingly enough, empirical evidence. Case one, we of course have an empty tomb. Now, for most crucifixion victims, their bodies were not buried, but left out in a common grave to be picked apart by wild animals. But in some rare cases, we do have evidence that several important people could be buried in a dignified manner. And every bit of our earliest evidence, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all agree that two members of the Pharisees, uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, um, take the body of Jesus and bury it in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, which is a new rock tomb prepared for his family. We also know that three days later, just as Jesus had predicted throughout his entire ministry, the body disappears. The disciples who had gone into hiding and who had every reason to hide away from the public view suddenly announce that the messianic kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus has redeemed us of original sin. This is radical. Now, many skeptics would like to say that just because we have an empty tomb as a matter of empirical evidence, that doesn't mean that we can necessarily logically come to the conclusion of a resurrection. Some people say that it was a subjective experience in which the, the disciples felt forgiven for their sins of flight away from the cross. However, against this point, we must realize the context in which these early Jewish Christians were living. Now, there are many people who claim to be the Messiah, or Christ, around the time of Jesus. These other uh, pretenders to being the Messiah often led rebellions against the Roman occupiers of Judea. Almost all of them ended up in a ruthless and terrible death. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, there was a man named Bar Kokhba who claimed to be the Messiah. He led an unsuccessful war against the Romans. In 70 AD, he was vanquished, and I believe it was Titus who marched in and burnt the second Jewish temple. This, of course, was a great tragedy, but it was quite accepted that once your Messiah was murdered, you would have to find a new one or give up the cause. What then could rationally explain? What could explain these men leaving, hiding, and proclaiming to the world that their Messiah was risen? We know that there are no such things as mass hallucinations. Um, hallucinations. We know for a fact that um, all of these members shared the exact same experience. Therefore, we have to rule that out. There is no motive for them to steal the body at all. And we know that it was guarded by a whole um, Roman force of centurions guarding the tomb. So who rolled away the stone? 
it seems to me that the only rational explanation is that the description of resurrection, of bodily resurrection, that the disciples were describing was genuinely the real deal. And Christ actually did empirically rise body and soul from the grave. And this leads us inevitably, of course, to our second point. The disciples and those who followed them said that at the end of the age, Christ would return to judge the living and the dead, and the dead in Christ would be risen. But of course, what did they mean by being raised? They meant the same Jewish belief that was widespread throughout the first century, that they would be raised in body and in soul. Now, of course, we cannot empirically prove, by pure philosophy alone, that is, that such uh, an event will occur, but we can prove this by means of revelation. Again and again in the Old Testament, there are prophecies of the dry bones of the saints being raised up, breath being breathed into them. And of course, we have a description of a loving God, a God who would choose to become man. Now, it only makes sense that the book of Revelation is correct in describing how God would actually wipe away every single tear and remake the world as Tolkien would say in his narratives, until the world is mended. Naturally, God would not leave this project, the material world, broken forever. He would return, and in rising every single person, he would bring about the restoration of all wounds, and of course, a pure, inexact judgment. This is why in Dante's Inferno, the the souls who are condemned in hell bewail the time when they will be raised bodily from the dead and brought to an even worse punishment and worse fate. And this is why heaven, as beautiful as it is, as a way station, as a, as a stopping place, in the words of the Anglican philosopher N.T. Wright, is not the end of the world. The new Jerusalem, or the heaven returning, actually is. Another puzzling comment I have often heard comes from Of course, St. Paul's description of Christ as the last atom. Now, what on earth does Paul mean by this? Well, there is one prevailing belief in Paul's writings. That just as sin and death came into the world by Adam, Christ being the last Adam, being God himself, the second person of the Trinity incarnate, has redeemed us by means of the cross. And therefore, his resurrection is, in the words of Scripture, the first fruits of that common resurrection which is to come. In that sense, we see how humanity, our human nature, is being called to a greater relationship with Christ, little by little, by acts of charity, love, and humility. And of course, these acts are born out of a living faith, out of grace. And it is by grace that we finally are moved and are always being touched. Now, what spurred me on to this investigation was an interesting experience I had two days ago. There was a hairdresser who I was meeting because my mother was having her hair highlighted. And she had lost her eight or nine-year-old son to bone cancer. She was bereaving his loss. It has been, I believe, two or three years now, just as it has been two or three years since I had my brain tumor. And I was asked by my mother to accompany this this grieving mother in praying. And of course, this mother, who's still bereft, was at times angry with God. How could you allow this to happen? How could you allow my, my baby boy to die? At the time, she put her son into the hospital, there are many promises of recovery, of health. But those promises did not come to pass. And what I explained to her, with all my heart and all my soul, was this. God the Father knows what it means to lose a son. God the Son knows what it means to experience death. And just as God the Son, Jesus, will be raised, is raised, sorry, rather, 
on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, so too will we will be raised at the end of time. And just as we will be raised at the end of time, we know for a fact that God knows what it means to go through all of our hardships and tribulations. God knows what it means to experience the pangs of being a grieving parent and the child going through the anguish. He sees things not from the outside, not like the deists say in a detached way. No, he is present. He's the active God, the living God, the God who's present in every single hardship and pain now. We know from Genesis chapter 3, when sin enters the world through our free will, that it never was God's plan for there to be suffering or death. But now that suffering and death has entered the world, God has taken upon himself in the person of Jesus an opportunity for us to use our suffering redemptively. Redemptive suffering means that we offer up our tears, we offer up our wounds. In my case, I offer up my blindness as a means of vision to the world. It is the hardest of all Christian principles to grasp. It is, without question, one which is a mystery. But like every single mystery that is in the world, it does not mean it invalidates the central point, that God so loved the world he would send his only begotten Son. Now, what we often hear from skeptics, such as the atheists, uh, Hitchens and Dawkins, and agnostics, that if there is a loving God, why go about this elaborate plan? Why not wave the magical wand so that everything is restored at the end of time? But of course, if that was the case, would any of us truly be happy? God has given us, of course, a thing called free will. The ability to choose. And what he has offered us is a chance to cooperate with his grace. Grace, of course, his loving presence, is always with us. But he loves us too much to make us automatons. He allows us to work with the great plan of salvation. But of course, as we know from scripture, that all of these acts of love which we commit are born out of a living faith that is pre-existent and is always calling to us. Long before we turn to God, God is already turning to us. This is Augustine's conception of what it means when he comes face to face with God in the episode, in the confessions, where he's anguishing over his own soul. And he feels as though grace has broken into his life. Who was it in that moment? God turning to Augustine or Augustine turning to God? Both. Fundamentally both. And in that sense, the paradox of free will and of grace or of destiny is something which we continually see seeing uh, played out in our own lives. Last but not least, <coughs> I was in the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, last week with a good friend, a, a Portuguese philosopher by the name of Sonia and theologian. Um, her critiques of religious art are quite beautiful. And we saw a beautiful um, display of the resurrection. But as we were walking away from this beautiful depiction of the resurrection of Christ, the moment of triumph, I brought her to the Egyptian exhibit because I'm interested in the biblical exodus. And what was interesting is we came across an Egyptian sarcophagus. I believe it was of the, God, I want to say of the Middle Kingdom, but I'm unsure. And inside the sarcophagus was a couple, a man and a woman. Uh, presumably husband and wife, who had been buried together. And I was struck with an idea. The skeptic looks at that couple buried for ages upon ages, for ions and ions, and says, there they will sleep until the end, until eternity. And their ashes will remain ashes and their dust will remain dust. But with the eyes of faith, with the eyes of Christian faith, I was able to look at those two mummified corpses, maybe not with my eyes, but with my imagination. And I was able to say to myself, you're only waiting a little while. And one day, those bodies will be raised in a supernatural way, maybe in an interdimensional way, 
Our bodies right now exist in only three dimensions. We hear in the Garden of Eden that bodies were clothed with light, whatever that means. And this makes me believe that when we are raised, we probably will have a heightened sense of relationship with matter, time, and space. But I was able to stand in front of those corpses and say, one day you will be awoken again. And when that time comes, I will be interested to hear your stories, the good and the evil, the hopeful, the just and the unjust. And in that essence, I walked out of that museum, not believing I had passed a bunch of relics of the past, but the ruins of a present world that someday will be mended. And it led me, ultimately, to sit down at home and begin investigating what it means to call Christ the last Adam. The early church fathers, such as Polycarp of Smyrna, the disciple of John, Basil the Great, I believe he was writing in the 200s or 300s. They often pointed to Christ in this capacity. But you're probably asking, and many feminist scholars have done this, what about Eve? If, we, if Christ is the last Adam, what about the second or last Eve? 